So normally when I'm transferring my video footage for my YouTube videos from my camera to my computer, I run a script that I call Sony Dump, and it copies all the, all the files off the card onto my computer and then runs RM in Linux, which removes the files from that SD card, and then I eject the card. I copy those files to my NAS after I rename them all, and that NAS has an hourly ZFS sh snapshot that also backs up the snapshot to my second on-site backup server, and it does that every hour. I also have Time Machine running hourly, so that should also back up all the stuff on my computer. So if I take more than an hour to do this stuff, I usually have one or two or sometimes even three backups already taken. At the end of the day, I run a sync command that synchronizes all my working files to an external Thunderbolt drive, and I always bring that with me. So I bring that home, I bring that when I'm on a vacation or whatever, so I have all my files with me as well. Unfortunately, because I was on a shoot that took all day and it was off-site, I came in at the end of the day, I copied everything on my computer, I renamed it, I copied it all over to my NAS, at least what I thought was my NAS, and um, the problem was that I actually had the external drive open instead of the NAS. So I copied all the files to that, and then I ran my sync command right away. This was all within like 20 or 30 minutes, so I didn't have that full hour where it would do all those backups. And when I ran the sync command, it actually deleted all the files that I had copied to that external drive because I have it set up kind of as a one-way sync, which I'm going to change that. But anyway, you can guess what happened. I just deleted all the files that I had taken that day, all the footage, which was going to be very hard to reproduce, um, probably like not be able to re be reproduced because it was something kind of special and interesting and had been in the plans for a few months. So many lessons to be learned, but the first one is don't delete anything until you're 100% sure you have all the backups going. And <clears throat> because I had copied it to the local drive and deleted them, I had nothing. I looked and maybe Time Machine had backed it up in that window because it was like 5, 6 o'clock, something like that. Nope, it had not. So the files were all gone. And in the past, like I used to do a lot of photography and PhotoRec is the tool that I've used for years and years, probably 10 or 20 years now. I don't remember when it came out, but it's always been extremely handy for grabbing a raw file off my camera card if I accidentally deleted them or something. I've used it probably three or four times in my life, and every time it was a lifesaver, it grabbed that one photo that I really needed. Uh, but photos are one thing, video is another thing. Photos are usually one file. Videos are more complicated, especially on Sony cameras. So I ran this tool, PhotoRec, and when you run it, you can, you can basically set a few options for what it's scanning for and how it scans. And a lot of articles online said that there, there were some options I could set to make it work better for the Sony cameras, but the problem was that all the files it pulled off on my uh, Sony A6700, uh, it was set to XAVC S4K footage at 30p, uh, 100 megabits files. So it recovered about 100 video files, which I was like, okay, this, this is good. I, I got some video files. The problem is they're split up. And each file had this like XML, I call it a sidecar file, a file that kind of gives some data for the video file. And I thought, okay, maybe I can use this together with the video file to get it to play because these video files wouldn't play by themselves. And uh, there's also some other data, like binary data or something that, that also does something. I don't know exactly what. And I'm not super familiar with how MPEG video works. But anyway, uh, the, the two types of files that I saw besides those XML files, there were the MP4 files, which were very large, so that's probably the video footage itself. And then there was these underscore moov.move files, and I'm like, <laughs> did they misspell .move, and it's like move with move or something? But apparently that's not the case, and we'll get to that in a bit. But um, I did see a lot of people mentioning that, you know, when you, when you import footage with PhotoRec, you'll get two files or three files for each video. And, but the documentation always said it was with .ftyp.move or underscore ftyp.move files. And if you combine those with the raw video file, then you'd get a working MP4 file. And the problem was, even if I checked the option in the settings for PhotoRec that says like move slash mdat recover mdat atom, atom is a separate file. Uh, even if I checked that, I would not get these FTYP files. So I guess that's just not something that these modern Sony cameras, Sony, Sony cameras do. Um, so I, I tried that, I, I redid the import like three times, and no matter what, I tried copying the move files the same way that people were suggesting the FTYP atoms, and that didn't work. It, it, it actually made a file that would play, but it wouldn't play anything. It would just be a black frame with no audio, and it would play the length of the .moov.move file. So that was not going to work. <laughs> Maybe something was weird with the uh, XAVC format that Sony uses. So 
at this point, I, I realized like before I do anything else, I should have like a byte for byte backup of everything on the SD card. So I opened up Disk Utility and created a disk image from the SD card using the, the little option in the file menu. And that saves a DMG or disk image file that works on a Mac. The other way you can do it is you can use the DD utility on Mac or Linux. I don't know how Windows is. You know, if you're on Windows, look up how to create a byte for byte disk image. But in uh, in Linux, you can, or, or even on my Mac, I could just say disk util list, find the disk ID, unmount the disk, and then run this command sudo dd, and then if is input file, so it's slash dev slash rdisk4 in my case, and then of is output file, and I called that like SD card backup dot image or something like that. And then you set a block size. Uh, I choose one meg because that's good for speed and all that. You can run that, and if you want to see progress, you can press control T while it's running, and it shows you how it's doing. Um, for my SD card, the maximum read speed is around 250 megabytes per second, which is a lot slower than like the internal storage on my Mac. But if your Mac doesn't have like 512 or one terabyte or two terabytes of storage, you might not be able to back up straight to it. So you might have to back up to a NAS, which might be slower or faster. I don't know. That's, uh, you know, you'll have to figure out in your specific case how that is. But for me, I, I just, I had enough space on my internal drive, so I backed up to that. And then you should probably do that first before you do any of this other stuff because you want to have a raw image to work with. And especially if it's faster, you can take out the SD card and then preserve that somewhere, set it somewhere, because that is your golden copy that you might be able to use if everything else fails. I didn't do that at first, but after this I did that, I, I made a backup image and then I worked off that image instead. And if none of this stuff works, the, the best thing about doing that is you can send your disk, your, your little uh, SD card, this guy, off to a company like Drive Savers or Data Savers or whatever, send this to them, and they could actually take the chip out of here. If your data is that important, and it might cost a thousand, two thousand bucks, they can take the chip out of here and then read the data off of it, even if like you formatted it in a Sony camera, which don't format things in Sony cameras if you want to ever have a chance at getting the files off, because it uses a different uh, way of formatting than I was used to with my Nikon cameras. But anyway, just putting the files together like that didn't seem to work. So the next thing that I tried was using a utility I had found, some people mentioned it on Reddit or other forums, called untrunk. And that, I guess, means untruncate. Uh, and the way that this software works is it tries to uh, kind of take a good video file from your camera and then mix it with a bad one and then put all these atoms, these little like descriptors for, for MPEG-4 files. It puts them together and kind of guesses at it using that data from a good file, and then hopefully that works. And some, some people have reported this works great, other people not at all, so I figured it was worth a try. And especially with the fork that I used said that it had Sony XAVC video support, so that's how my camera does it, so hopefully that would work. And uh, the way that I did this was I took my camera, the same camera with all the same settings that I remembered from uh, recording on site yesterday, and I just recorded like a 30 second clip and then I took that clip, I put it on here, and I used that. I actually took a 30 second, a one minute, a minute and 30 second, and a 15 second clip because apparently different clips can kind of help or hurt the process. So the, when, when you're getting to this point, you're, you're really uh, grasping at straws and anything that I saw in forum posts or GitHub issues that I thought would work, I tried. Um, but anyway, the first time I ran it, I used a Docker container version of it. I just built a Docker container like is recommended in the readme. I ran the command using the Docker image, and then uh, it didn't do anything. It outputted like a 100 kilobyte file, which is definitely not going to work. It doesn't have the video footage in it. So I tried again with the dash S option, which means like skip through unknown sequences or step through unknown sequences. That means like if it hits an error, it'll keep going and keep trying. And that time it actually did something. It, it, it had all this output. And at the end, I had a file that was not quite the size of the original MP4, but it was a lot bigger, like 2 gigs instead of 2.4 gigs. So I opened that, and it actually played. It had the right length, it had a few bits of audio, but the playback was horrible, and it was very stuttery, and even when there was a good frame, it had a lot of distortion in it. But the good thing was that I knew that there could be the possibility of recovering some footage, because I was seeing some of the footage from our shoot at the uh, tower site. Um, so next up, I wanted to see, is there a way that I can get the full video playback and get it smooth and make the audio work and all that kind of stuff? So I kept researching, and, and at this point, I started going down the rabbit hole of how MP4 files work, because I'd never really looked into it. I, I know that there's 
I didn't know they were called atoms, but I knew there was like the metadata for it and then the actual raw video and you can't separate the two, otherwise you have problems. But uh, the guy who wrote the original version of Untrunk, Federico Pancio, has a great article talking about how he, how he basically set it up and why he set it up. And he mentioned that uh, he had a problem where his, his Sang, Sangsung, I don't know if it's Samsung or Sangsung, his camera died while he was at a marriage ceremony and it left a MP4 file that nobody could play. So he had to basically reverse engineer this and he did the same thing that, he, that I mentioned. He, you take a good, uh, a good video that you know works, that you recorded correctly, and then you take the bad one and then you kind of mix things together from them. So I also, after reading this, I, I was like, okay, maybe if I take the move.mov file and put it at the end of the video, maybe that'll work better. I don't know, because it was a little confusing seeing how the, the files are constructed with the headers and the information about the video and all that. That didn't work. Um, but I, I also, at this point, I was getting very desperate. So what I did next was, I was like, I, I don't think in one day I'm going to learn all the intricacies of the MP4 file format. Uh, but I was, I was thinking about it. Uh, but next up, I decided since I had a little success with Untrunk, I would just try to brute force it. I took all the files, there were like 50 files, and I found all the .mp4 files and I ran untrunk on all of them. And I did it with the small file, the really small file, the medium file, and the large file. I did that with all of them to see if any of them did any better or worse. And actually the, the small file seemed to do the best, the one that was about 30 seconds. So I don't know why that is. They were all the same data rate. They were all the same shutter speed and ISO and all that. So who knows what, it's like the contents of the video file made the numbers match up better. However, uh, even after doing that, and here's the shell script that I had for that. Even after doing all that, uh, I let it run and it took like an hour or so and it used up like, you know, four terabytes of space. I did this on the NAS because my local hard drive on the Mac doesn't have that much space. But uh, as with that first video clip, only about half the video clips worked. And by worked, I mean they had little bits of playback and the audio was, the audio was actually good on a couple of them, but it was really choppy and had a lot of static on most of the clips. So this was... Uh, I was, not, uh, I was not doing so well at this point. I think I had put in about 12 hours at this point of different experiments. And, you know, so sometimes it's like an hour of you, you kick off a process and you go away and you come back. But still, 12 hours of, of wall time on this. And uh, I, th I thought maybe I was hitting a dead end. I found this other tool called MP4 Fixer, which might or might not work better. It looked like it used the same kind of overall process as Untrunk. So I decided not to do that. But as a last ditch effort, I, I, all my searches would bring up all these different utilities like Ease US or whatever, the things that looked, they just looked off. I don't know. When, when you're looking at, uh, like, you know, I come from shareware days and freeware days where some of the programs are like, that looks like it could be malware, or that just doesn't look like they're building a program just to help people. That looks like they're building a program to scam people. And a lot of the tools that I found online seemed like that. And like even reading Reddit posts and things, some people said that. So I decided not to try those, but I did find a few good mentions of a program called Disk Drill. And the logo for it is a little weird. It just reminds me of like in Incredibles 2. So I was a little off, but the one thing I liked was you pay for it. And it, like you can, you can preview the scrub, but you pay for it when you use it. And I tend to trust things a little bit more if I can pay for them, but it just didn't, it didn't have the same vibe of like, this is trying to scam me. It seemed like they had good documentation. They had, uh, you know, people were posting, people who didn't seem like bots were posting about it on Reddit or on uh, data recovery forums or on Twitter. I saw a couple posts or X or whatever. So I downloaded the preview version. I saw that it saw like the file structure was just interesting. I, I never saw the file structure with PhotoRec. So that was a good uh, sign. But when I, I, I decided just to pay the money for it, just to see what would happen, because it's worth it to me up to a certain point. And uh, I paid for the license and I recovered the video files using the standard recovery method. And that, uh, it was the same thing. Basically the, play, the files were unplayable and I used Untrunk and could get a couple of them kind of playable, but not really. However, as I was about to give up and I was going to say, all right, I'm not going to get these video files back. I'm just going to have to figure out a different way to do this video or not do it at all or something. I found that uh, Disk Drill had something that just got added this year called Advanced Camera Recovery Module. It's like a special tool built into it that I guess it probably integrates some of these tools. Uh, or it, maybe it just brute forces it. Maybe somebody at Disk Drill has like bought all these cameras and they just sit there and reverse engineer the, the video formats and how it lays out the files on the file system. I'm not sure. 
but it looked promising, so I gave it a try, and uh, it was, it, it found the video files. It didn't have the video file names, the original names, but it, I didn't care about that. I just wanted the video files. I hit recover. It took like 30 minutes, and when it was done, every single video file played perfectly. So I don't know what magic thing, magic stuff they have under the hood. I, I'm guessing they just like reverse engineered the file formats, and I wish that it would be open source software, but I, I understand. Like they, they probably have full time people, and they probably pay for these cameras and things to, to reverse engineer the formats. So, uh, you know, I, I'm okay with paying for software when it, it does solve the problem, and I can understand that they, you know, because of the way that they probably have to structure their, their work on it. I get it, you know, that's okay. I prefer open source software, but I do pay for software too. And I'm happy to pay a good price for software that sustains it and makes sure that it's not just gonna be like a one-off or the company's gonna fail because they did one sale or, you know, it's not a subscription. I paid for the perpetual license. So I think that the conclusion of all this is, first of all, uh, don't delete video files if you're working on a big project. Uh, and don't do that until you're 100% certain you have all the files backed up everywhere you need them to be. For me, I actually, what I did was I, these cards are kind of expensive, but they're the best cards that I've used for SD cards. Uh, and since this is like my business is on these things, I am okay paying a premium for these really nice ones that are also very fast. So I bought eight of these total now. So I'll, I'll be able to cycle through these and I will keep them, after I do a shoot like that, I can keep the card in my little uh, card bin and leave it there until I either publish the video or I'm like I'm finished with the edit and I've exported everything that way. If I ever do need a file off of here, I can get it back off of here. And then after that, I can put it back in the camera and erase it and that'll be fine with me. So that's the first lesson. But the, the second lesson is I did learn a lot about how the MP4 files work and I'm more confident that if I could put in the time and, and uh, learn a little bit more about the structure, I probably could have tweaked things to the point where I could get those video files back myself. I just didn't want to put in another couple days into this. Um, but the, the cool thing is as time goes on and these open source tools get a little bit more expansive, maybe they will have the ability to pull back that data from the newer Nikon cameras. Like I have, I have an a7C2 and an a6700. These are both the latest of their like small form factor bodies. So probably not as many people have these two bodies. If I had an a7S3, which is like the most popular of the modern Sony cameras, that one, maybe it works because maybe somebody had already reverse engineered it and put that code in and that's what it's based on. So anyway, I guess the moral of the story is don't delete your stuff until you are 100% sure that you have backups of it. And maybe don't rush through things at the end of the day. I, what I should have done is just put it off until the next day. Because when I did that, the, the first thing that happened was I was like, oh no. And then it's like the end of the day, I'm already tired. I had sunburn and everything. And then I started trying to recover the data and that's never a good solution. So maybe maybe also wait until you have enough rest to, to get into something. Anyway, uh, yeah, second channel video. I wanted to put this up mostly because I have a blog post, but I know that you know people see these videos on YouTube. I wanted to give my feedback in a YouTube video so that when people search, because YouTube videos usually show up higher in Google results nowadays, uh, when people search for how to recover data, they can get some of the feedback here, which is completely unbiased, completely, you know, this is an independent test of all these different tools. And you might not need to buy disk drill, but for me, what uh, something I learned was sometimes just buy the proprietary app and it'll work great. And I would recommend you buy the perpetual license because that way you can get upgrades in the future. Anyway, see ya.